summer can be a bit of a slog. For us, it's often for some reason a rather busy time, and I'm sure we're not alone. Well, you can beat the summertime sadness and the August angst and enhance your everyday with our excellent sponsor, Via Hemp. This is a company that crafts award winning premium THC and THC free gummies. Each of these gummies is especially designed to cultivate a specific mood. Whether you're looking to get relaxed, get quality sleep, get creative, or just to get focused. If you're 21 or older, you can experience it for yourself and get 15% off your first order with our exclusive code MSHEET at viahemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. I personally enjoyed their grapefruit flow state gummies. This CBG and CBD powerhouse really helped me tap into my productivity. Like, we have had an extremely busy summer, and I feel Flow State got me over the finish line a few times. When I was editing multiple episodes a day, digging through documents, and knocking out a bunch of interviews. Biohemp does not require a medical card, and it ships legally to all 50 states. It's also affordable, and even more so for Murder Sheet listeners who get a special deal. If you're 21 and older, head to viahemp.com and use code MSHEET to receive 15% off. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P dot com and use code MSHEET at checkout. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Enhance your everyday with Via. Temp check. What kind of summer are we having this year? A family road trip summer, a beach bum summer, or a wake me up when the sun sets summer? With Instacart, choose your own adventure and skip the shopping side quests. Where available, you can get ice cream delivered to your hotel, sunscreen to the pool, or cold brew to your bed. Well, door, in as fast as 30 minutes. Wherever you find yourself this summer, you can get the goods. Download Instacart for free delivery on your first three orders. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum $10 per order. Excludes restaurants. Additional terms and fees apply. Have you ever covered a carpet stain with a rug? Ignored a leaky faucet? Pretended your half-painted living room is supposed to look like that? Well, you're not alone. We've all got unfinished home projects. But there is an easier way. Thumbtack is the app that makes it easier to care for your home. Pull out your phone and in just a few taps, search, chat, and book highly rated pros right in your neighborhood. Download Thumbtack and start caring for your home the easier way. Content warning, this episode contains discussion of murder and violence, including violence and murder against child victims. It also contains discussion of domestic violence. So it's Friday, which means we're back with another edition of The Cheat Sheet. We're going to be covering a variety of crimes from one end of the United States to the other, and we will be concluding with me offering an awkward apology. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Cheat Sheet, Violence and Vigilantes. Let's start off the episode in Wisconsin. This is a sad and disturbing case coming out of the city of Two Rivers. And it involves a missing three-year-old boy named Elijah View. So this child was seemingly last seen on February 20th of this year. And there was a man supposed to be watching him. So Elijah's mother is a woman named Katrina Bauer. And a man named Jesse Vang was seemingly watching him this morning. So he claims that he brought the boy into his room after he dropped his teenage son off at a bus stop. And 
They napped. But when he woke up around 11 a.m., Elijah was gone. So there's not been a lot of information on this case lately. We know that there is a $25,000 reward. And the tip line for anyone who may know anything, it's 844-267-6648. Keep the tips relevant. You know, they want people who know things about the actual case, not like suggestions on how to do the investigation. But what's disturbing is that there have been charges handed out, even though we don't know what happened to Elijah yet. Katrina Bauer and Jesse Vang are facing child neglect charges. Bauer so far has pleaded not guilty, but it seems like there is some kind of case against them for at the very least at this time, child neglect. And it's incredibly sad. I mean, a little baby, a three-year-old cannot advocate for themselves. And when something like this happens and there's scrutiny on the caregivers, whether that's somebody who's just watching the kid or the parents, it's always very disturbing to me because, I mean, a child relies on those people to stay alive. And when there's something going wrong there, that's very disturbing. But so far, searches are continuing to go out. I think some good sources on this are the C. Hafer News outlet, um, WEAU, WBAY, and ABC7. And we also checked out the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children page for Elijah because that gives you a sense of what he looks like. So this child is still missing. We hope he is found safe. But um, it's certainly very disturbing when a child this small disappears like this. Yeah, violence against children, I think, is something that really affects a lot of people more than other crimes because they are so vulnerable and really rely on others. And a child should be given a safe environment to grow up in and thrive. And when something like this happens, it's just horrifying and a reminder of how cruel the world can be. Absolutely. For our next case, I was thinking we could go down to my old stomping ground of Virginia. And this is out of Stafford County, Virginia. So Elijah's case is ongoing and very new. This is an older case. And our sources for this one are the Potomac News, which we accessed through newspapers.com, as well as CBS 19 did some good coverage of it. So back in the 80s, two women were brutally murdered in Stafford County. Uh, so the first case happened on November 14th, 1986. A 32-year-old woman named Jacqueline Lard. She was last seen working in um, her office. Uh, she worked at a real estate firm on Garrisonville Road in Stafford. And the next day, um, the office was found in disarray. There were signs of a struggle, disturbing details. Her body was ultimately found on November 16th of that year in a wooded area by some kids uh, covered in an old carpet. And her vehicle was found December 18th in Fairfax County. So she had been she had been murdered and, um, you know, they they immediately began looking into this. One interesting thing about Miss Lard or Mrs. Lard is that she was actually the wife of a drug enforcement administration agent. So her husband, Ron Lard, was a DEA agent. So the question early on, I imagine, was... Obvious question. You know, did, did his work um, have anything to do with, you know, criminals retaliating against his family? And... That must be like a nightmare scenario for anyone in law enforcement, that the work they do could boomerang and affect those they love the most. It's horrifying. Also, I'll note, I think one of the early articles said she was 32, but I'm also reading that she may have been 40. So I, I think 40 is accurate, but there seems to have been some discrepancies. You do see that with early newspaper coverage of a case. Reporters are not perfect. They're trying to get details out there. They may mishear. They may get the wrong thing. So just flagging that. But yeah, what a horrifying situation for him and their whole family. And um, and for the people who worked at the Stafford Mount Vernon Realty office, like that's a horrible thing to happen to your coworker as well, especially at work. And this went unsolved, you know. And and Ron Lard was the one who had to come. He was out of town at the time on on the job, has to come in identify her body. Just horrifying. Relatively quickly, 
uh, law enforcement puts together what they called a non-complete profile. And I'm, I'm going to read it out because there's going to be some things wrong with it that you're going to find out in the end. And, and I, I think that profiling can be a wonderful tool for law enforcement in a case. It can help you conceptualize things. It can help you maybe hone in on some of those psychological aspects of a crime. So I don't think profiling is useless, but I think that it is hit or miss. And therefore releasing a profile publicly to the public is not always the best thing for a case because, you know, you can get details wrong and then you have everybody looking for one thing when they should be looking for another. So their profile, non-complete profile was, um, said the killer must be several years younger than Mrs. Lard of average intelligence, which I don't even know what, you know, like that would be kind of hard for people to even think about. Um, cause what does that mean? And then they said he was white and a semi-skilled or manual laborer. At least one of those things turns out to be wrong. Maybe some of them turned out to be correct. So a profile in addition, you know, you can get a bunch of things right, but when you're directing the public in one way, then, then that's where it's a problem. So that's anyway, my spiel about profiling. Unfortunately, three years later, there was another victim taken. So March 29th, 1989, a young woman from Stafford named Amy Baker. She's visiting family in Falls Church, Virginia. It's just kind of surreal because I'm like relatively familiar with some of these places reading about this. And I, I never had heard about this case before this. Um, but she goes home and her car is later found abandoned. So Virginia State Police find her car. And uh, that that discovery occurred on March 31st, so a few days later. And this is uh, around Interstate 95. Um, her body is found in a wooded area near an exit ramp. So that also goes cold. In 2021, the Fairfax County Police Department submitted evidence to DNA Labs International. And that, in addition from help from the state database, ended up linking the two cases. So same perpetrator. Then Parabon Nano Labs gets involved. Now, they're very well known in the true crime space. They do a lot of incredible work with genetic genealogy, identifying perpetrators. So they've Figure out the, the family name of the suspect on December 14th, 2023. They figured out it was Harrison. Now they have to look at the Harrison family and determine who is the specific perpetrator. Because obviously, you know, you could be related to somebody, share their DNA, but you're not a bad person. Like, you can't just try to start arresting everybody in the family, right? Well, they narrowed it down and figured out it was 65-year-old Elroy Neal Harrison. And he was ultimately indicted by a grand jury on first-degree murder, abduction, and other charges. And, yeah, so they got him recently. And now, he doesn't fit the profile. He was actually black. But, you know, maybe some of the other details were accurate, being, like, you know, relatively intelligent or a manual laborer. I don't know. I guess that will come out later on. But it does show you, I mean, I hope some of these perpetrators of, of these violent crimes, especially the, you know, the ones where they, there's some sort of sexual assault going on, seemingly, or some sort of DNA left. I hope they're all shaking in their boots right now, because <laughs> it really seems like a lot of these things are just being cleared and figured out left and right. Yeah, this is a very interesting time for us all to be alive when we get to see so many old cases solved. I really, my heart goes out to the Lard family as well as the Baker family, and I hope that this is able to at least give them answers about what happened to their loved ones so long ago. It's frustrating in these cases because, you know, someone like Harrison gets to go live his life for decades while they're suffering and, and his victims don't get to live theirs, but I'm glad he's alive. I'm glad he's alive to possibly face repercussions for what he did to these women. Speaking of violence against women, let's get to this next case out of Illinois, out of Chicago. This one is um, horrifying to read about, not only because of what happened, but because of how much our system, the system let down this one family and just the f agonizing results of that. I just I just feel so disgusted 
reading about this case, I can't really even put it into words. So it centers around a 37-year-old man named Cressetti Brand. You know, years and years ago, he was romantically involved with a woman named Lataria Smith. And he was a violent man. He did a home invasion, harmed harmed a woman. He had protective orders against him from ultimately Smith and several other women. And he ended up getting handed down a 16-year sentence. So meanwhile, Lataria Smith moves on. She has uh, children. She has a, an 11-year-old child named Jaden Perkins. Um, she has a 5-year-old, and, and she's pregnant. And Jaden Perkins was, as I mentioned, 11 this year, just uh, an incredibly talented, wonderful child, a wonderful dancer, um, you know, showing that artistic, creative side from a young age and you know, thriving in that space and just by all accounts, just a wonderful, wonderful kid. And, you know, they're, they're, they're having their lives together as a family and and that's, and that's wonderful. So after serving eight years, Brand gets paroled in October. So on January 30th, he starts texting Smith, threatening to kill her and her family. So this is a violent offender who's just been paroled. And is texting her, texting a, a, someone who has had a protective order against him, that he's going to kill her and her family. And then it gets worse. It escalates. February 1st, first he shows up at her apartment in Chicago and tries to break in. She calls the police. <laughs> she hasn't had, like, anything to do with this man for years and years. And so he's doing this, and she calls the police, as you should. And they they don't they don't have her file anything. They don't. They don't really do anything. They just tell her to go to court. So, okay, so we're already starting to see things go wrong. This guy's getting paroled. He's still out and doing these things. So, yeah, definitely not exactly a case for rehabilitation here. And then the police are saying, well, just go to the court. And then she goes to the court. So February 21st, she asks for an emergency order of protection, which seems like pretty reasonable given what he's doing. And frankly, like, she needs more than an emergency order of protection at this point because that's a piece of paper. You know, I mean, that's ultimately he's going to do whatever. But at the very least, then she could potentially bring it to someone and say maybe he should be picked up on a parole violation. So she's running around doing everything correctly to protect herself and her family. But the judge, Thomas Nowinski, doesn't really feel like she has sufficient evidence for an emergency case. So he continues this until March 13th. And this guy's out there. I mean, he's out. Um, At some point, he is picked up again. And his case goes before the Prisoner Review Board, which makes decisions around this in, in Illinois. And they they look at this and they felt that the allegations against him didn't meet the standards to detain him any further. So they release him on parole again on March 12th. The following day is supposed to be the day that, you know, the the, the court has continued stuff until and they're going to take a look at it again because, you know, they don't feel like it's an emergency. That morning, he shows up at her apartment, stands outside when she opens the door. He forces his way inside and starts stabbing her, a pregnant woman. Jaden, her 11-year-old, tries to intervene and protect his mother, and he stabs him to death. And the five-year-old is watching all of this. I cannot imagine anything more horrific and just completely unnecessary as something like this happening. And this man is showing all of these warning signs, all of these red flags. He's obviously not rehabilitated if he's freaking running around and threatening women and their children. And nobody, <laughs> nobody's, nobody's able to do anything about this. I mean, isn't, isn't stuff like this what parole violations are for? I mean, like, I I just don't understand. And so obviously it's caused a firestorm. You know, uh, you know, the, the police chief gets out there and is complaining about this. But frankly, I don't feel like the police who responded to Lateria Smith in the first place exactly covered themselves in glory. I don't know why there wasn't more of an effort to get the police report in there and, and take it seriously. It just seemed like every time 
she's doing everything correctly and trying her best and is not being given any resources and is not being partnered with any groups that can maybe like temporarily take in her and her family to get away from this guy she's left to deal with it all on her on her own um as a mother taking care of all these children and she's doing her darndest to to make it happen and she's up against this apathetic system that just let her down and let her child down and now now Jaden Perkins is dead and and it's it's that's not that's not right it's enraging i feel so angry about this you know the governor jb pritzker he's kind of thrown the re- review board under the bus i i think it, it so to give you a sense uh the chair donald shelton resigned recently not clear if it's over this but uh a woman named uh miller uh, Leanne Miller, who was the one who recommended Brand's release for some reason and also conducted his hearing where he did get the parole. She also has resigned. I think the prisoner review board messed up here. They they say that they didn't have the information that Smith was even seeking an order of protection against Brand, and they normally wouldn't get that information. Well, if that's the case, I feel like there should be a pipeline of information if the person that you're thinking about releasing is suddenly doing all of this. Like, I, I don't know why there isn't more of an effort to monitor the person and make sure they're adjusting. Frankly, that feels like it would be a good thing even for people who are being paroled and are not doing anything bad because you're ensuring that they're getting the help and support they need to reacclimate to the outside. But in this case, you know, it's it's like I feel like that should there should be like a an emergency light blinking if if somebody's starting to escalate and show violent tendencies again. Like, I don't know why there's no pipeline for that. It should be taken seriously, especially I'm going to say this, like maybe this is controversial, but in my opinion, especially in domestic violence cases and stalking cases, and this isn't about someone doing this because they're having economic hardships. This is about a man trying to control and threaten a woman who tried to get away from him. Like, that's not something that's that's there's something more deeply embedded there. And I feel like those cases need to be treated with care. And maybe people should not be released unless you're very sure that they are rehabilitated enough to be a safe person in society. Yeah, it's just horrifying. I'm just reading this and I just feel so bad for this mother who is just trying to do everything and is just going up against a brick wall again and again. And the horror that she and her family went through on that morning just makes me sick. I just, I, there needs to be, especially in cases that involve domestic abuse or violence like this, there needs to be a way to get her the resources she needs and to have people take somebody in that situation incredibly seriously when they're saying this person is threatening me. Absolutely. I mean, I I don't know what to say other than I agree with you completely. And this is just, it's enraging. It's, it's, it's an utter failure. Yeah. This little boy should be here right now living his life. He should not have been brutally killed in this way by some. He was failed. Yeah. And, and, and this guy, Chris Eddie Brand sounds like he frankly shouldn't have been paroled in the first place. Getting the smile and confidence you've been dreaming about all from the comfort of your home isn't a total mystery with Bite Clear Aligners. Just don't be surprised if all your friends start asking, what's your secret? Begin by ordering your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95. Bite Clear Aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces, plus they offer flexible financing, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. Across America, BP supports more than 300,000 jobs to keep our energy flowing. Jobs like updating turbines at one of our Indiana wind farms and producing more oil and gas with fewer operational emissions in the Gulf of Mexico. It's and, not or. See what doing both means for energy nationwide at bp.com slash investing in America. Anyway, 
anyways, so I think you have another case in Illinois. I have another case in Illinois. Uh, this one, uh, my source for it was a story from The Guardian. Oh, I should say mine were CNN and Chicago Tribune. Okay. My source for this story coming up is The Guardian. And because it's a relatively recent story, there are things we don't know. Mm -hmm. We don't know the names of the victims. We don't know the possible motives. But uh, this story jumped out at me, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why after I share this. This is something involving a man named Christian Soto, and this took place in the town of Rockford, Illinois, which is, I think, about an hour and a half northwest of Chicago. I used to have family in that area, wow. so I, I've been in Rockford. This man, Christian Soto, did a home invasion into a woman's residence and was stabbing her. He attacked her. She got away from him and fled outside where she was assisted by a good Samaritan. Soto went outside as well, and he stabbed the good Samaritan. And then over the course of uh, about 20 minutes, I believe, he went on a stabbing spree, for a lack of a better phrase. He ended up stabbing, reports indicate he stabbed uh, 11 people, four of whom died. And it, it's possible that that number might go up. Oh, God. So it's unclear why he did this. One of the people who passed away, I should mention, was just... Uh, a, a postal service employee just doing his job. Uh, so it's, it's unclear why he did this, but Soto has been arrested and is facing charges. And t to me, it's like we're at, at a state in the world where violence and the fear of violence threatens to take so much away from us. We've had mass casualty events at like outdoor concerts we had uh, people murdered at uh, a Super Bowl parade a couple of months ago. We talked about it on this program. And so that means that in the back of our minds, when we take play, when we take part in some of these events, we have to worry about things that might happen. And then here we have a case where a woman was just literally in her own home and she can't even be safe there. Violence even impinges on that. And then we have this mailman just doing his job. I say mailman. It was a postal service employee. I don't know if it was a male or female. These are just people living their lives, and they have to deal with uh, the threats of violence. And Rockford's a nice place. So it's, it's, it, it's upsetting. So I'll be following this one because I'm curious why this happened. There's never a good reason. There's no reason Soto can supply that would make this make sense. It sounds like, at least according to the Independent, he's immediately blaming laced weed, which, like, no. <laughs> I don't. There, there needs to be, I think, part of, I mean, certainly, I don't want to get into a political thing, but, like, there's we have America has a unique problem with gun violence. Then again, this is a this is a knife spree. So it speaks to some, you know, you're not going to you're not going to stop a knife spree by legislating around guns. Obviously, I think that I think that there needs to be some sort of massive moonshot effort around mental health in this country. Not to you know, it's not about stigmatizing people with mental illness. I'm not even saying that. It's necessarily people with diagnosable mental illness doing this, but I, I feel like there is a we're at a crisis in terms of some of this stuff when it comes to, you know, people harming themselves or harming others. And maybe if we had more easily accessible and affordable resources, that there could be preventative measures done before things got to that point. That's outrageous. And I, I think what you said about our our society yeah. becoming so awash in violence and it feeling like it, it just sometimes seeps into everything is absolutely on point. With that said, let's move on to our final case this week. This is a case 
out of Nevada, and 8 News Now has done some excellent job covering this case. Uh, This case uh, involves a murder that actually took place back in August, and there was uh, an arrest made in the case actually fairly quickly. This is, the murder victim is a man named Aaron Chavez, and he was uh, murdered by a man named uh, Gino Julian. Uh, Julian was actually uh, picked up and arrested when he was sleeping in his car in the desert, and uh, a burned body is about 10 feet away and the murder had not taken place there but he he was i guess transporting the body and his car got stuck so he called for a tow truck and he was asleep you said and he was sleeping (laughs) okay now we do know something about uh the background and the possible uh motivations here uh chavez the murdered man is uh, accused by some people of taking advantage of them financially, of ripping them off in different schemes. And so this, I I suppose, is what uh, motivated uh, Julian to go after him and, and commit this murder. He said at one point in some text that it was street justice. Oh, man. And now what we're talking about it now is that there was just uh, another arrest in the case, a man named Stefan Jakubov. Jakubov, it turns out, was actually texting with Julian, the murderer, while the crime was happening, urging him, break his face, do this, do that. And uh, apparently uh, Jakubov was even watching uh, a live stream of the murder as it happened. And again, the motive for all of this is street justice. And I, I, I think it, I, I've not gone into all of the intricacies myself. I don't know if the murdered man, Mr. Chavez, actually committed these crimes he was accused of or didn't, or if he took advantage of people or not, or what kind of penalties he might have been facing. But I I do know in life there are many times when people do you dirty and it gets into your head and it kind of takes over. And the fact of the matter is the best revenge is don't let people get into your head. Just forget about them and move on at all possible. If you just start focusing on grievances against you and focus on trying to get revenge or street justice, it escalates and you become a different person ultimately. And you could lead to a situation like this where whatever gratification you imagine you got by committing your street justice, you're going to pay a very steep price for it. I think it's telling that one of the texts mentioned respect or this is how it feels to be disrespected. Yeah, I think there can be a very toxic focus on respect. Obviously, respect is a good thing. We should respect each other. We should respect ourselves. It's not, but what it what it becomes what it becomes in some of these contexts is more of like an assault on your honor, and your honor is not something that's like some sort of intrinsic goodness inside of you. It's how other people perceive you. It's very superficial. It's on the surface, and the fear is if I if I disrespect Kevin, then others will be emboldened to disrespect him. That's the fear. Perhaps that's an understandable psychological impulse to have that thought, but. It kind of just becomes this like tit for tat nonsense of like in order to reclaim my honor and reclaim the respect that others have for me, I must use violence to sort the situation out rather than going through appropriate channels such as reporting it to law enforcement or filing a civil suit or dealing with it in any number of ways. And the ironic thing is, if you're concerned about respect and you do something like this, I can assure you that there's nobody reading about this case and thinking, oh, boy, I really respect Julian Jabakov. They really handle this well. Yeah, no. They look ridiculous. Also, I mean, yeah, people who are incarcerated are, like, disrespected by society. Maybe maybe in some cases unfairly so because people can make mistakes and come back from that and recover from it. But 
you know, you're putting yourself in a situation where you could be locked up for a very long time. And it it just doesn't it doesn't really make sense to to people who are thinking about it rationally. Obviously, when you're in a situation and you're feeling emotional, perhaps some of that logic goes out the window. But I guess the answer is violence is never the answer unless you are defending yourself from violence, unless you are being attacked, in which case, yes, you should you should probably be violent to fight them off. But and if, if someone has done something that upsets you and you're still thinking about it, you're letting them win. Just walk away and get on with your life, if at all possible. It is it's it's sad to see something like this because you just feel like, you know, I think we, you did a, another revenge case a while ago where somebody was uh, taking revenge, uh, plotting a murder. They did not successfully complete it about uh, avenging his mother from a drunk driver. And in some cases, you can really understand being very angry with someone or, or not forgiving them or, or being just irate or wanting some sort of accountability and, and taking it to to the proper authorities. But, yeah, when it comes to actually doing something yourself, it's just it's just it ultimately it just harms you. I mean, the person doing it. And I think most people realize that, but I think some people have a hard time realizing that. Are we ready to wrap up with my awkward apology? Yes. What is this shocking apology? Are well, you gonna, I don't think it's shocking. Are you going to do a, Are you going to do like a YouTube video or like my mistake and like cry on on camera or something? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, fair. It's going to be more dignified than that. Well, not really. So I I think we've said we really if you see us in public and you recognize us, we love Call it. Call the police now. <laughs> We we love it when you come up and say hello and talk with us. That always makes our day. We love talking to people who listen to the show. I mean that quite sincerely. And usually when I'm out and about, I'm with Anya, who not only is a beautiful woman, but she's very charming and articulate. And so well, you're very sweet to say that. I wouldn't necessarily agree. Well, so this means if someone comes up to us, Anya can do most of the talking. And then all I have to do is just kind of smile and nod. Which I am very good at that. I am excellent at the smiling and nodding. So last week, uh, and speaking of things that get into your mind, I've been thinking about this way too much. But so last week, we were at a, uh, there's a place in Indianapolis, I think it's called the garage or something. It's a food court. It's kind of like uh, a food court at a shopping center. It's only. cool. It's, it's a good place. Uh, and Ani and I have a place to go soon and, uh, we were stupid and didn't realize there were like major sporting events going on. And so <laughs> there's apparently some sort of basketball thing going on. There's a basketball thing and also like Indiana comic con or something. There's a lot of people in town. So this place is packed and there's like no tables and we're in a hurry. And, uh, I have my, my food, I'm standing, I'm holding, uh, a bottle of Coke and this kind of awkward little paper tray that has a fish sandwich and some chips in the other hand. And Anya has disappeared into the crowd <laughs> to go get her food, which is not a fish sandwich. And I'm sitting there and say, how can I eat my fish with, with like one hand? I think, I don't think I can eat this sandwich one handed without there being a, a sandwich emergency. Something's going to fall. And so this is the, the way my mind works. And so, well, so I'll, I'll break off a, a piece of the fish and just eat it that way. And as I'm doing that, I think, boy, do I look stupid. Thank God Anya's in the crowd and not seeing this because I'd never hear the end of it. And and then someone comes up and uh, recognizes me and, and says, hello. And everything in my mind, I'm just focusing on, I look ridiculous. I just look like the fool. And I, I, I sa he says he enjoys the show, and I thank him. And I say, we really appreciate you listening. It was very nice of you to come up and say this. And then he goes away. And then uh, it's been haunting me because I feel I should have engaged with him a bit more. I feel – I don't think I was rude. I, I, I thanked him for his kind words. But I feel like he didn't get his due. So I apologize because I was obsessed with this fish sandwich situation and I was fully aware I looked the fool. And then Anya comes back a few minutes later and I tell her what happened and she said, oh, what was his name? And I said, well, I didn't think to get his name. And she said, well, well what does he think about what's going on in the Delphi case? And I said, well, I didn't think of that either. So 
apologize. I'm apologizing to you. Uh, I'm calling you Fish Sandwich Man, even though I was the Fish Sandwich yeah, Man. Yeah, you were the Fish Sandwich Man. This man was an innocent bystander. So I'm sorry I was preoccupied with the fish and did not give you the attention you were due. Certainly, if Anya had been there, she could have been, I, I have no doubt. Anya is such a graceful, articulate, oh, charming woman. She could have had my fish sandwich on a tray. She could have had her food on a tray, three or four bottles of soda for some reason, and still been able to hold a excellent conversation. I probably have dropped it all and made a fool of myself and somehow ended up covered in sushi. But that that's just me. I think you give me too much credit. I think you're too self-deprecating. But, but thank you to this man who listens to us. We really appreciate it. And... uh and I'm so neurotic. This has haunted me all week. Yeah, we're awkward people. <laughs> we're, we're we're very awkward people. So if you ever see us, um, I think I've definitely like had situations where like I I probably I don't know. I've been told that I have um. They say you know they there's a resting bee face, right? Yeah. But I've been told that I have resting panic face. I remember one of my friends in college told me like Anya. I always see you power walking around. I didn't wear glasses at the time, so I couldn't really recognize people. I always see you power walking around campus with your backpack, power walking, brushing past people, just looking terror stricken. And he said, I think whenever I see that, I think something terrible has just happened or something terrible is about to happen. So I was like a harbinger of doom at times in my life. And so I would say that, um, yeah, so I think sometimes I, I, pro- I probably – look crazy and and just look like i'm like in the middle of a panic and i'm probably just like living my life so don't worry about that if you see it if you know but yeah i i, I have like a resting food slob face because i'm <laughs> I, i'm just like shoving pieces of fish in my face <laughs> instead of using the bread which is why i was given the bread <laughs> I just looked, you know, there's that episode of Seinfeld where, like, George is, like, caught on camera, like, eating uh, a messy food at a sporting event. And so I was too preoccupied with the fish, and I should have engaged with him more and asked him some questions about himself. Oh, well, I we appreciate this, man, and thanks for coming up. And, yeah, I'm sure I, I, you're a little self-deprecating, Kevin, so I'm sure it wasn't that bad. I, I, I think I, I – sh- I don't think I was rude, but I, I don't think – I was engaging as I should have been. Well, I will just say that I think you and I are what happens when two Georges get married. (laughs) I feel like we're both George Costanza trying to pretend not to be, you know, because we, you know, are trying to engage with the audience and not be super friggin' weird all the time. But it's very, it's a struggle. (laughs) It's a daily struggle. Yeah. And (laughs) and there's, there's a food thing that I'll I'll mention that I think will embarrass both of us. Oh God, what's going to happen? Which is that, uh, separately Anya and I have had a food issue oh, that, yeah. that has been the concern of our family and loved ones all of our lives. People in elementary school at lunch would point it out to me. We both eat ridiculously quickly. The captain from True Crime Garage can attest to this. He was horrified by what we did to those tacos and he only publicly made fun of Kevin for that because he's a gentleman and he respects women and I appreciate that. I appreciate the captain for that. But he knows that I was eating those very quickly, too. Anytime we go to a restaurant and a, it's a sort of restaurant where you get something from a waiter or a waitress, the waiter or waitress will give us our food and then they'll come back later to ask see if we need anything else. And they say, oh, you're already done. What's wrong with you? They say. And we say, we're so sorry. We don't know. We eat like starving dogs. Yeah, it's pathetic. It's really embarrassing. I don't know. I've why. done it all my life. Yeah. Before I met you. Same. Always done it. And then we met each other and we're like eat done at the same time and we're like what <laughs> Soul- true love soulmates <laughs> we have a lot of very strange similar habits like that so it worked out but and many of them are not embarrassing or shameful yeah was, several of them are not embarrassing or shameful but it's definitely yeah so now now you, now you guys all know our secret shames so again i'm sorry i did not engage more with this this gentleman and if you ever see me by myself, uh, j- just say, Kevin, try to be more like Anya. No, don't say that. Don't say that. Well, at least in that context. Not, no, I think you're probably fine and you're being a little hard on yourself. And 
Um, you forget that I'm capable of being incredibly awkward too. But what people should know is you can always come up and say hi. If we're awkward, it's definitely not you. It's completely us. And, uh, you know, that's that's just the way we are. But um, but we always love to chat with people and engage with people who listen to the show because we appreciate you. And it's really nice to meet you in person. So, um, you know, sometimes I'm like, I'm just like, I don't know why people would want to spend time with us, <laughs> like, you know, like listening to our thoughts. But it's an honor to be able to you know, your time is precious. And the fact that you are willing to spend some of that time with us makes us very grateful. So it's always really nice to meet you. So never feel like you're going to bother us. or We're going to be mad or, you know, if you see us at Kroger or whatever, you could say hi. You don't. Or the is it called the garage food court? I think it's the garage. It's it's in an old, uh, really Coca-Cola. beautiful Art Deco Coca-Cola building yeah. situation. It's really cool. It's a cool place. They got some cool uh, stands there. Um, and definitely we enjoy eating there although it was pretty chaotic and we were it, yeah last time we, we had we so we had no idea there was like a major sporting and event we're not in touch with the the cultural events of the city and then like I'm, I'm walking downtown and somebody's all excited and said hey boilers and he like gives me a fist oh bump. yeah that was and, so I, and I return and say oh yeah those boilers i had no idea what i was talking about your dad went to purdue that's the embarrassing thing you should know what the boilers it is, are. It is embarrassing that i have family that went to purdue no no no, no. no. don't start a war with the boiler makers kevin we have n- we always enjoy coming up to lafayette we've been at, at purdue many I'm, times I'm, I'm just kidding there's a stupid r- r- rivalry between IU and Bloomington in Indiana. I went to IU. The fact of the matter is both school are both schools are excellent in different ways. Yeah, they are. Uh, yeah, Purdue has more of like the engineering edge, I feel, like the kind of sciences and then IU the humanities. So they kind of they do different things, but uh but no, I I mean I knew the boilermakers. That's so funny. I remember that we were on the street and guy just came on to fist bump Kevin. I guess he he could sense that your dad went there. That was probably <laughs> that's probably it. And on that note, uh <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for listening. Apologies again to Fish Sandwich Man. No, and... you are the Fish Sandwich Man. We established this. Uh, hope you have a great week. Yes. Everyone have a safe and wonderful weekend. Thanks again. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murder sheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening.